Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Johnstone. I teach constitutional law uh, at the law school here. Um, de Tocqueville famously wrote that scarcely any political question arises in the United States that is not resolved sooner or later as a judicial question. He said, the language of the law thus becomes in some measure a vulgar tongue. The spirit of the law which is produced in the schools and the courts of justice gradually penetrates beyond their walls into the bosom of society so that at last the whole people contract the habits and the tastes of the judicial magistrate. Um, and of course this exchange goes both ways. Sometimes the language of the people finds its way in the mouths of the magistrates. Um, witness the appearance of the broccoli analogy to the individual mandate, which began in a 2009 blog post, migrated into talk radio and then the federal district court, and finally ended up appearing no less than a dozen times in uh, the Supreme Court's opinions in the healthcare cases, uh, where Juth, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, referred to it uh, as the broccoli horrible. Um, well, we see both of these dynamics, this exchange of the everyday and the legal, the judicial, in this conference where uh, something as everyday, as visceral, as, as technocratic, and as personal as healthcare is framed in these abstract legalistic terms such as rights and responsibilities. Um, and so that even in constitutional law, when in order to teach my class this fall, uh, we could not study liberty and federalism the regulation of commerce among the states or providing for the general welfare without also talking about guaranteed issue, community rating, adverse selection, and minimum essential coverage. Uh, to help bridge this gap for us uh, and introduce us uh, again to the broad view of the Affordable Care Act, uh, we are lucky to have uh, Mark Hall uh, with us. He's You've already seen him, some of you, but I will uh, introduce him. He's the Fred D. and Elizabeth L. Turnage Professor of Law at Wake Forest uh, in the law school there. Um, he has a JD from the University of Chicago and is one of the nation's leading scholars in the area of uh, healthcare law and policy and medical and bioethics. Uh, he's authored or edited 15 books, authored articles in the leading law reviews, currently engaged in research in areas of consumer-driven health care, doctor-patient trust, insurance regulation, we'll hear a little bit of that today, and genetics. He also teaches uh, in the MBA program in the uh, Babcock School at Wake Forest, um, and also is on the faculty at the medical school. He regularly consults with government officials and uh, notably uh, helped lead an effort of 104 health law professors in writing a friend of the court brief in the healthcare cases that the Supreme Court uh, decided last year. Um, so uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Mark Hall in uh, introducing us to the Affordable Care Act. Thank, thank you very much. It's, it's a very distinct pleasure to be here. I uh, had the opportunity to to come and speak uh, just at the beginning of the national debate on the Affordable Care Act, uh, uh, Dane Scott had me out in, 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 uh, in a similar form, and uh, now to come here uh, at the sort of just uh, at, at the cusp of its full implementation uh, is quite exciting and a very nice sort of bookend to the four years of, of, of debate that's ensued and, 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 um, uh, and, and discussion and, 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 and uh, policy analysis. Um, and I, it's just a terrific place to be doing this. I was so impressed last time I was here and, and again today, uh, the extent of interest and involvement uh, in the community in these issues. Um, I am affiliated with the center and such at the, um, all right, I'm supposed to plug my center. Um, it's not up there now. Oh, does that work? It's not advancing. Um, I'll do it this way. Um, in any event, oh, there I am, yes, my center. But uh, so I know how much work it is to organize one of these things, and, and, uh, and, and I just want to give kudos to uh, 
to Dane and Rob for doing such a terrific job. I've organized a lot of these things. I've never had such an interesting sort of engagement among uh, the panelists, and I've never had such uh, an excellent attendance from the audience. And so these are uh, great hallmarks of, of, of a job well done, and, and I'm just pleased to be part of all this. So um, I want to start with sort of acknowledging the sort of the level of confusion surrounding the Affordable Care Act. Um, um, even what to call it. Uh, we call it sort of Obamacare uh, almost by default because we haven't yet found a felicitous name for it. And that was partly, uh, as uh, Jim Rohn was saying, the, the problem the Democrats haven't, haven't crystallizing the name of something. They, they, uh, this thing is not called uh, anything that you can pronounce. It's abbreviated PPACA, which uh, is an abbreviation that has no pronunciation. And so we end up with a, a variety of other things. And uh, we've settled on uh, Obamacare, which originally had a sort of a derisive quality to it, but I think is now acknowledged as a sort of a, uh, a term that encompasses various intonations and meanings. But in any event, we'll call it the Affordable Care Act, I think. But uh, partly the problem is, well, what does that mean? What does the thing really cover? And so it, it um, so the mis misinformation, I mean, began with the Sarah Palin death panels uh, comment that we've already mentioned. But uh, shortly after the law came into effect, uh, factcheck.org sort of had a, had, had a hit list of sort of the the, the five or ten worst myths about the law that the, the fact that uh, the individual mandates enforced through the uh, through the tax system meant that you'd have 16,000 IRS agents uh, uh, who happened to carry guns I don't I didn't know that but uh, enforcing the law that um, the the fact that religious organizations uh, conscientious objectors could opt out of it, uh, it became a, an exemption specified for Muslims uh, and, and I suppose reference to questioning the, implicitly the president's uh, religious uh, affiliation. Uh, similarly, um, the, the, the try to implementation, try, trying to implement the electronic health records be, became the idea that it would Im implant microchips in all of us to carry health records. And, and my favorite is sort of uh, standardized uh, uh, coverage would become a mandate that covers erectile dysfunction drugs for sex offenders. Well. That actually happens to be true, but it was already in the law. <laughs> it's just because uh, everybody who has a medical need for these things, uh, any of it. So just, uh, you know, you can't separate the fact from the fiction, from the exaggeration, from the missed, uh, you know, statement. So, uh, and, and part of it is, I think, just a uh, failure to communicate what is this law mainly about. So it's not actually mainly about affordable care. It, it's perhaps about affordable insurance. But I mean, if you think about the two sort of major problems that we've been hearing about over the last uh, day. I mean, the fact that we have this large number of uninsured, um, uh, Ovik is exactly right. It, it, does, uh, it only cuts that in half uh, at best. Uh, and so we still have the problem of the uninsured even after the law is fully implemented. The fact that it's 25 or 30 million versus 50 million is, is a major, I think, uh, advance or improvement, but it doesn't solve the problem of the uninsured by any stretch of the imagination. The fact that we're spending this unsustainable amount of our economy, uh, approaching 20% of the, of the uh, gross domestic project, uh, product, product approaching uh, the astonishing $3 trillion. The law does nothing about that, actually. It, 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 I mean, if anything, it, it, it knocks it up a nudge. Uh, there's some sort of experimental demonstration things in there that hope to sort of put into place some cost containment, but there's nothing really sort of that fundamentally changes the, the economics of, of healthcare payment and, and delivery. And, and the fact that we now cover more people means we'll probably end up uh, spending a, a smidgen more. So it's not, uh, it doesn't have a good name, and the name it has isn't, isn't actually accurate. And, and here's the reason, because if you look at the core of what is it that the law does, it's not Obama taking over the delivery of healthcare, it's not socialized medicine. What is it? It's the elimination of medical underwriting. All right, so there you have it. The president you know, gets up and says, I've got a grand social scheme that will eliminate medical underwriting. All right? So it, it takes a degree of sort of policy wonkiness that, that, that all the panelists share, but I'm, I'm, you know, many people in, in the public that, uh, don't that, uh, understand what, what is medical underwriting and why would we want to uh, uh, eliminate it. So that's what I want to explain, is that if you sort of keep your eye on this prize uh, of, of getting rid of this bad thing called medical underwriting, uh, all the major pieces of the law begin to fall into place. And so I want to sort of start by explaining the basic structure and logic of the law in terms of this uh, attempt to reform how health insurance, private health insurance, um, is, is marketed and sold. So medical underwriting is simply the process by which uh, uh, people at the, at the health insurance company figure out uh, who's sick and who's healthy and what your likely health care costs are going to be. Uh, underwriting is the process of evaluating insurance risk and evaluating insurance risk based on medical costs is called medical underwriting. And so the, it's a problem if the market uh, uh, 
you know, excludes people with pre-existing conditions or excludes those conditions that are actually bothering them or charges them a great deal more than, than anyone could possibly afford. And so um, there sort of was widespread agreement that the market would function much better, uh, as all the major examples uh, in the world do that, uh, that Ovik was referring to, if we eliminate this process of assessing individual risk and, and then uh, deciding uh, whether to offer coverage and on what terms. Um, so this sort of no more medical underwriting becomes the banner under, under which this law is, is structured. Um, and, and, and what it basically means is, is this, just this flat, simple prohibition. So of all the things that the law does not accomplish, it does accomplish this one simple, clear thing that never again may um, insurance companies exclude uh, you know, sick people or exclude uh, the problems, uh, the pre-existing conditions that sick people have. Um, no, nor may they charge you more because you have uh, pre-existing conditions and such. So uh, forevermore, everyone in the country has this guarantee of access to uh, insurance coverage at, at sort of uh, average uh, rates, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, so it's, it's a sort of a promise of insurability. Even if we don't all get insured, we ha all have now the, the, the actual ability to qualify for insurance. Uh, and, and, and that, again, sounds uh, uh, like it's sort of a fairly narrow victory. I mean, the first point is that no one sort of disputes, uh, hardly anyone disputes, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that that's a good thing. I mean, if you're in the business of doing medical underwriting, you might say, I've lost my job doing medical underwriting, so they wouldn't agree to it. And there's certain economic theory that says that medical underwriting serves useful purposes by sending price signals about health behaviors, but that's getting a far bit too more technical for you know, most people to really sort of rally behind as, as a sort of a, a cause of, 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 of preserving this aspect of a market-driven system. So most of us believe that you know, this is probably a good thing. And what I want to stress is, why is it a good thing? Because I mean, if most of us have insurance uh, already, and if you have it already, you can roll forward into other insurance, and, and we already have legal protection to keep the insurance that you have. It uh, didn't take uh, President Obama's promise. We have other laws known as HIPAA and such that allow you to, to, to remain covered. But the problem is that, that there's just sort of this almost subliminal worry, I think, that many people have that you might become uninsurable. You hear too many horror stories about someone who let their insurance drop for under HIPAA more than 62 days, I think, and, and then you can't get back in. So you change jobs, or maybe, uh, and, and, the, and the new job doesn't have insurance, or you go back to school and start a, you know, uh, a second career, or you become a, uh, you know, a freelancer, an independent contractor, what have you. All these things uh, get evaluated against the backdrop of, you know, can I keep the health insurance that I need, or can I get back into health insurance? And so if you think about the ability to get insurance as something that really ties to major decisions that we make, think about relationships and marriages. People might feel stuck in a marriage because uh, the insurance comes from the spouse and you won't qualify uh, if you leave a bad relationship and such like that. That it really becomes a sort of a, a, an aspect of fundamental human freedom that, if you, if, that, that opens up uh, a broad array of possibilities that was really freedom enhancing in the most sort of fundamental uh, way that, uh, that it means, uh, you know, in terms of our uh, career paths and in our, in, our, in our intimate relationships and marriage and such that is tied to health insurance and those argue well it shouldn't be tied to health insurance because it shouldn't be tied to jobs but it, but, but it, it, it is in, in the world in which we live and so if we eliminate this threat of becoming uninsurable we really uh, expand the scope of, of, of possibilities. So this point is I think a huge relief to many people and, and people haven't really quite psychologically sort of connected with it because they haven't experienced it yet. It, it, it becomes the law Stroke of midnight, January 1st, 2014. And at that point, I think we'll begin to realize, well, gosh, okay, I really, and, and even now, for those uh, in, their, in their 20s, so one of the immediate provisions of the law, as uh, the younger people in the audience probably know, that you can stay on your parents' insurance until you're 26. So my kids are in their mid-20s, and they've taken great advantage of this. Uh, they, uh, instead of going and getting a, a decent job after college, they've goofed off and, uh, you know, uh, been a freelance artist and, uh, you know, had odd jobs and such. And, you know, I said, that's fine until you're 26, and then you've got to think about you know, your future. But the point is that, that, that uh, and I know the job market isn't that great, so maybe you don't have a choice but to, you know, do odd jobs and, uh, I wouldn't say goof off, but, uh, you know, uh, to, to try to figure out what your future entails. But the point is that it, 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 it uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it affects people's decisions coming out of, uh, uh, one situation into another, uh, you know, health insurance isn't uh, something that uh, people in their, uh, you know, mid-20s or younger 20s have to think about, uh, and, and, and that opens up a, a broader range of possibilities. 
Um, it also addresses this issue of market friction that, uh, the, uh, that I referred to briefly, just that it's an added administrative cost to have to do this screening, uh, et cetera, and so perhaps would help reduce this annoyingly high overhead cost aspect. So this uh, riddance of, uh, of medical underwriting is a major achievement, and the question is how do we bring it about? What are the elements of the law that are necessary to make the market uh, work uh, uh, functioning well with, uh, with, without medical underwriting? Now, all that's the good news, but the, the bad news is, is, the, is the piece that, the, that, that, that's the subtitle for my talk, uh, which is uh, the community rating piece. So one aspect of eliminating medical underwriting is saying that insurance companies can't vary their rates according to health status. Um, and one aspect of health status is age. Um, and so although technically it's possible to have age rating without medical underwriting, because you don't have to look at medical records and such, it's, it, it's, it, it's part of the whole picture of what's going on here. So one decision to say you can't vary by actual health conditions, uh, another was you can't vary by uh, demographic fa uh, features or attributes that are likely to, uh, to predict uh, health uh, expenditures. And one of those is gender, so we have gender neutral rating required by the law, and the other is age. So the law allows insurers to vary their rates by a factor of three, 300%, three to one, um, according to age. And uh, that's a form of community rating known as adjusted or modified community rating. Pure community rating, as we alluded to briefly, is, is uh, the same rate for everyone regardless of age, and that's what they happen to have in Switzerland. Um, uh, uh, Age-adjusted community rating uh, would typically allow uh, a variation as wide as 5 to 1 or 6 to 1. So, these are sort of made up numbers. The problem with using numbers, if you claim that they're real, you always get criticized for their not being accurate. So I don't claim any of my numbers are real. They're just made up. <laughs> so uh, you can't criticize me now. But they're illustrative. So imagine that a, sort of a median priced product was around $4,000. Now admittedly, that's kind of on the lower end, but it's, it's possible to get you know, sort of uh, you know, data that shows that you know, maybe that's, that's uh, you know, kind of coverage is out there. It's sort of as, as the median price. Now, if, if, you, if the market were to sort of to be unregulated in, with respect to age rating, it, it might produce, let's say, roughly a five to one spread, which means that, say, 60-year-olds uh, might be paying $7,500 for the same coverage, and 20-year-olds might be paying $1,500. So 20, 75 is five times 15, and 4,000 is somewhere in the middle. Now, I don't know that it would spread exactly evenly like that, because age slopes and distributions aren't necessarily linear. So again, uh, that, that not, not necessarily, it may, it may be, uh, you know, the, the, it would be 1,800 versus 9,000 or some, some, other, some, some, other, some other formulation of 5 to 1. So what 3 to 1 says is, um, all right, we compress that range somewhat. We, we require uh, the 20-year-olds to pay somewhat more so that we can uh, redistribute, in effect, from the young to the old so that the uh, elderly, uh, uh, and we, 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 we were talking about folks, let's say, in their 60s who aren't yet uh, on Medicare, would pay somewhat less. So again, this is not the actual rate tables uh, that are going to be used, but uh, as an illustration, uh, for instance, uh, you might have a three to one spread with still 4,000 in the middle where the, um, the, uh, the younger folks are paying 33% um, uh, more, 2,000 instead of uh, 1,500, and uh, the older folks are paying, uh, say, $1,500 less. Uh, for instance, um, or some other spread of that nature. But it's, it, the idea is um, there is some differentiation based on age, but not as much as the market would allow. So, so to, to focus on the theme uh, uh, probably to excess uh, in terms of what I actually want to convey, which is the overall sense of how the law is structured, this is so, uh, 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 sort of a schematic um, uh, rough approximation of, of what we're talking about. Now, why is it that we would want to do this? So sort of philosophically, why do we want to get rid of medical underwriting? Why do we want to uh, do some form of community rating? So here's a, um, a, a graph that uh, I think conveys what I, what I believe is one of the fundamental attributes of, of, of health insurance markets and, and social policy around health insurance. It's the same point that uh, Jack Mudd made last night with a, a similar graph that was, that was with bar graphs. Um, so let me spend a little time with it because I think it is so essential. It's uh, health policy walks refer to this as the concentration of healthcare spending. But shortly after I was here four years ago, I had the opportunity to give uh, testimony before the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, Senator Baucus's staff invited me and said, "Come tell us what we you think we need to know about how health insurance uh, markets work." And I said. 
this is a great opportunity. Let me really think, what is the most important thing to know? And I ended up with something like this. And so I threw it up and spent you know, 20 minutes of testimony time talking about it. So let me try to see if I can do it in two minutes with you all, because I do think it's so important. So the idea here, and I'll refer to the, the, uh, the chart on my, uh, on my right, that if you rate the population in, in terms of how much health care they consume, from those that consume nothing to those that consume extraordinary amounts, uh, what percentage of the total spending uh, do those uh, folks account for? So uh, the folks who uh, consume very little uh, account for very little of the spending, almost by de default. But the point is that it's not a straight line where sort of as you go up from the bottom 10% to the middle 10% where they're sort of increasingly, you know, uh, uh, spending 10% more uh, of the spending, that, that most folks uh, spend uh, relatively little. Uh, in fact, uh, I sometimes uh, summarize this as the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the population spends so little that they account for only 20% of the total spending, which means that most of the spending, 80% of the spending, is concentrated in this uh, up, steeply uh, upsloping portion of the curve, and sorry to be, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, whatever, mathematical on you, but that, uh, here we have 20% of the population that's counting for uh, this huge portion of the upslope of cost. 20% uh, uh, accounting for 80% of the cost and 80% accounting for 20% of the cost. So you take any other break, it's kind of shocking. If you take the top 2% uh, or so, um, they account, and let's see, I can't even read my notes here, but uh, for something like, um, well, the top 5% eh, account for something like half of the expenditure. So you have a relatively few number of very, very sick people uh, or uh, sick people who are using very, very expensive technology, let's put it that way, because a lot of very, very sick people, there's nothing uh, you can do for it uh, that costs a, a lot of money. But some people, you know, consume quite a bit of money, and these are folks who are in intensive care for months at a time, or who need major, uh, you know, heart transplants and such like that, uh, accounting for a great portion of our expenditure, but uh, the vast bulk of us are, you know, spending sizable amounts, $1,000, 2000 $3,000 a year, but amounts that uh, in grand total don't come anywhere close to accounting for the, the bulk of the expenditure. So with this kind of dynamic, and let me sort of stress, this is not an artifact of our sort of heavily government regulated system or our market driven system or whatever hybrid. This is not an artifact of um, the particular statistical basis for this. This is sort of a fundamental law of, 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 of human nature, if you will, of human biology. This was true in the 1930s, this is true in any other country you want to mention. This is true for people in this room, if you think about it. Or if you separate the room between the, those who are over 40 and those who are under 30 or whatever, it would be true in those subgroups as well. It's, 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 it's almost a statistical phenomenon, but it's simply the common sense idea that most of us are pretty healthy most of the time, and the kind of health care we need isn't really that expensive. But in any given population, there's the 5, 10, or 20% of us for which uh, bad things are going to happen that are either unexpected or predictably uh, bad things are, are happening to us that are going to cost a lot of money. And those, you know, that minority is going to cost uh, the majority of the expense. Now, given that that's sort of true, sort of in any time and place, uh, more or less the same, the shape of the curve would be a little bit different. It might be a higher or lower curve, but it would have basically that same shape. How is it that we want insurance to work? We don't want insurance markets that try to separate uh, these folks from these folks. Obviously, that's the way that competitive markets are going to want to behave. We want insurance markets that are going to pool these so that these folks pay uh, a bit higher so that we can afford to cover these folks. Uh, some of these folks know that they're going to be there, but some of these folks last year were over here and over, end up here unexpectedly. There's a whole mix of sort of predictable and unpredictable high expense things. There's a whole mix of things that are high, high cost because it, uh, people's behavior, but uh, are high cost because uh, people's genetics or, or people's uh, misfortune. So you can't say that there's any sort of particular, I mean, there's obesity in here, there's hang gliding in here, there's genetics in here, there's you know, uh, reckless driving in here, there's you know, unforeseen accidents in here, there's everything in here. But at the end of the day, it distributes itself this way. So how, what, how do we come to grips with this, this reality? Well, the, the policy decision is pooling. Uh, that, that's what insurance is supposed to do. And so you say, well, one predictor of this is, is prior uh, health conditions. So we say we don't want insurers to separate uh, prior health conditions from, from no higher health conditions. Uh, another condition is gender. We don't, we don't say, well, those expecting to have babies from those expecting not to have babies. We don't want to separate those. Um, uh, same with age. Gender slash by age is, is there. And so the question is, in general, do we want uh, insurance companies to sort of uh, price out people's individual health risks, or in general, do we not? And so we have made a collective sort of communal decision that we don't want that to happen. 
Now, we could differentiate and say some kinds of health risks should be priced out and some kinds should not. But if we're going to differentiate it, it should be on those behaviors that are sort of controllable that we want to send price signals to say, well, if you smoke, you should pay more. Um, and, and the law actually allows that. Uh, but to say, well, uh, if you're older, you should pay more, there's a certain logic to it, but it's not a compelling logic. It's, 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 a, um, it's more of a question of how can we keep insurance affordable for the bulk of the people um, should we uh, have, um, but, but, but it's not a, a, you know, sending price signals about age doesn't serve any particular sort of behavioral price efficiency. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't do anything about your age. And so uh, the judgment is, well, that feels more like your genetics or your other uh, sort of situations of life than it does the things that should be priced out. And so that's kind of the social judgment behind it. But we'll come back to more of that in, in, in just a minute. So, so th th that's the logic of it. And you can agree or disagree with it. But having sort of understood the logic, then I think the pieces of the law sort of fall into place much more easily. So you see how I've reduced this, Jim, to a nice sound, sign uh, uh, sound bite, right? A 20-minute sound bite to sort of explain what is the Affordable Care Act. Um, uh, so, so to do this, we have to tell, uh, 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 so we, some people refer to this as the three-legged stool. To make this work, to eliminate medical underwriting, uh, uh, and to keep the market functioning, you've got to do three things. First, you've got to eliminate medical underwriting, uh, prohibit the turning of people down and the screening of risk. But to make that happen, you've got to mandate purchase. So the deal is, if you just tell insurance companies you've got to take everybody, no questions asked, then who's going to buy insurance until you really need it, right? We're all rational economic uh, actors. And if we're told that we can get insurance on the way to the hospital, we'll wait till we're on the way to the hospital to get our insurance. And, but a market couldn't function that way. So you've got to uh, you, the other side of the coin, the other sort of uh, inherent piece of requiring them to take everybody, that everybody has to get coverage at the sort of the point that, 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 that life presents the, the, this opportunity. But of course, you can't get coverage unless it's affordable. So the third piece are the sort of the subsidy structure that makes the coverage affordable. So it's those three pieces. The insurance companies have to take everybody, but everybody has to sign up. And the government uh, has various structures to make that insurance uh, affordable. So that's it. That's it in a nutshell. This three-legged stool, this elimination of medical underwriting, you have the, the, the prohibition of screening coupled with the mandate for coverage coupled with the subsidies. And all the rest is just details. So what are those details? Well, you start with Medicaid, um, the, the program for the poor. And of course, the simplest way to do things is simply to have a socialized insurance system like Medicare for all. Uh, Medicaid is different than Medicare, but it's, it's basically the idea of social insurance. And so previously, Medicaid only covered about half the people who were poor, officially poor. The government decide, defines who's poor in some formula. I'm not quite sure how, but in any event, we accept that definition. And if you take this sort of poverty line and say who's covered, bunches of categories of people have no Medicaid access currently. Some uh, children themselves and pregnant women were more generous to, but others, working parents, um, um, uh, jobless parents, uh, childless adults, uh, people with sort of no good reason to be poor uh, have much more sort of, uh, if you have a kid, you have good reason to be poor. <laughs> if you're disabled, if you're elderly and retired, uh, these are the uh, demonstrably good reasons to be poor. But, but uh, others, so we have the system of categorical poverty. Uh, the Affordable Care Act sort of simplifies all that by sort of raising all these votes up to this level of, it turns out to be, for technical reasons, 138% of, of poverty. Uh, I mean, it was 38% uh, higher than this federal line, but it, it, it's roughly $15,000 for a single person or uh, uh, double that for a family of four. Um, uh, qualifies for Medicaid. And Medicaid, of course, is, is what you've heard described, but it's free. It covers uh, everything. You may have a hard time uh, finding a doctor, but, 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 but everything's covered. So um, uh, that's uh, one piece of it. Um, the next piece is um, the, um, with respect to employers. So much of our system is employer-based. The Clinton proposal was to um, mandate that all employers cover. Um, and that, was, that not, never even got out of committee. Um, uh, it, it didn't even come close to vote in Congress. And so um, as um, the Obama uh, team was exploring what was politically feasible, they said, well, we're not going to mandate employers. We're just going to try to keep them engaged uh, with what's called a pay or play option, which is to say, um, it's your choice. You can provide insurance uh, or not, but if you don't, then you pay a tax, in essence. Uh, and that's only for employers with more than 50 workers. Um, so um, uh, we, uh, the hope is that they'll continue to, to, uh, to provide insurance, but uh, it's, it's their choice. 
Uh, with respect to individuals, so the requirement is on individuals to arrange your coverage to say either um, sign up for the, what your employer provides or sign up for Medicaid if it's available. If not, go to these new insurance exchanges to purchase coverage. So we'll provide subsidies uh, similar to what you know, employers would do for working people. The government would subsidize the purchase by individuals. And the subsidies are pretty generous. They scale up on a sliding scale basis all the way up to four times the poverty level. And uh, again, until you put numbers on that, you don't realize what that means. But for a family of four, it means something close to $95,000 a year. Um, uh, for a single person, it means something close to, say, about $45,000 a year. So this is way above the median income, uh, which is about $50,000 per household. Uh, more than half the population, if they don't have um, uh, employer-based coverage, would be eligible uh, for one of these subsidies. Now, up towards uh, the high end, the subsidies would be pretty mild, 10 or 20 percent of the coverage. But down towards the lower end, they'd be quite generous. Um, and, and, and the goal there is to keep insurance affordable at this metric of costing less than 8% of, of your household income. Um, uh, parents uh, uh, are, um, uh, children uh, under the age of uh, 26 are eligible to stay on their parents' policy. And um, again, everybody's required to sign up for what's available to them. Uh, the details on the mandate are that um, if you don't sign up, uh, the, the tax penalty uh, will soon be $695 a year. Initially, it's only $95 and $395, but after two years, it's up to $695 uh, or 2.5% two, two of income. Uh, but only if the insurance you have available, after taking into account the subsidy from your employer or from the, uh, the government, only if that costs um, uh, less than 8%. If, if it costs more than that, then, then you're exempted and, and, and you're legally uh, uninsured and don't have to pay the penalty. Um, so where does all this money come from uh, for, the, um, uh, for the subsidies, for the Medicaid expansion, and what have you? Uh, well, it's going to cost about uh, uh, $100 billion a year, and that's a lot of money, obviously. Uh, a lot of dispute on how that number was calculated uh, in terms of the front-loading of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the taxes and the, and the, and the back-loading of the expenses. But uh, rough, rough numbers, that's about what it costs. Where does that come from? Well, about half of that comes from spending cuts. Uh, and a lot of those cuts come from reduced uh, Medicare payments, not with respect uh, to uh, the coverage uh, that uh, seniors are, uh, will receive, but with respect uh, to somewhat to uh, hospitals and specialists, but also with respect to these uh, private Medicare plans, the Medicare uh, Advantage plans. Um, the other half comes from increased taxes. And some of those uh, increased taxes are also the taxes that get paid into Medicare itself. So higher income folks have to pay higher Medicaid taxes now, Medicare taxes uh, for the first time, as well as a variety of other miscellaneous uh, taxes and penalties, such as on tanning salons, which I take it to be was a dig at John Boehner and his, his uh, tan bronze look, or I don't know where that came from, but a list of other sort of miscellaneous things. And I, I think one of the critical points here, was, was, again, that the, the dog uh, uh, made well, which is that, is that if you look at where the money comes from, it comes to a large extent from um, uh, some of the low-hanging fruit that was in Medicare, that if it had not been used for these purposes, could have been used in some uh, s soon, to, soon, to, soon to be someone else's uh, uh, administration who finally gets around to making Medicare solvent, because Medicare is always on the sort of uh, six-year projection towards bankruptcy, but six years is always conveniently someone else's administration. But at some point, we're really going to have to solve the Medicare solvency issue, as, as, as was well illustrated. And when that comes, that's this many degrees uh, fewer of freedom in terms of money in Medicare to help Med Medicare solvent. So to that extent, there was some sort of taking from the elderly to um, help uh, the non-elderly. And so I think puts the generational equity here in, 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 in somewhat different perspective, um, if you will. Uh, uh, so again, uh, the benefits weren't cut, but uh, provider payments, insurance payments under Medicare were cut, and, and, uh, and, and that's... Um, on balance left a sort of a balanced budget. Uh, the law doesn't increase the deficit, but it makes it harder to solve the deficit uh, in, in a future administration. All righty, so uh, this went to the Supreme Court, and uh, it, it was the most exciting case since certainly Citizens United, for perhaps since Bush versus Gore. Uh, hardest seat in town to get was to be in that courtroom, and I was one of the lucky ones. My, uh, here's the secret. I was sitting right in the front row, right up there, uh, my dean, it turns out, has, was in uh, the uh, Army, uh, the, the, it's called the JAG Court, the Army Lawyers, and uh, with the guy who's the clerk of the court, he runs the court, and those Army bonds uh, run deep, and so the dean hit up his Army buddy for a ticket for me, and he sat me right up in the front seat, and it was, it was very exciting. I, 
Uh, I got in early because uh, I was a guest of the, of the clerk of the court, and he sat me front and center. And then a few minutes later, um, other people started to come in, and this usher uh, tapped me on the shoulder and says, could you move down? I was, oh, no, I'm a friend of the clerk of the court. I'm not going to move down. I look up, and it's none other than uh, Senator Baucus. He wants to say, okay, well, I'll move over to Senator Baucus. Okay. And then I get another tap on the shoulder and just like move down. I look up, it's John Kerry. <laughs> okay, I'll move over for him. Orrin Hatch. Uh, Patrick Lee, I was sitting right in the middle of the Senate Finance Committee up there in the front row. So um, uh, it was quite a scene uh, for, I mean, quite experience for me. But as you know, the, the, the anticipation of this decision um, and, and, and the pre predicting of how it was going to come out, it was quite, uh, quite a major event. And uh, this is one uh, well-read uh, website that, uh, that I happen to be quoted on as one of the legal experts. Uh, who were completely stunned by the decision. And how do we know that? Well, here's a photo of me. The moment I, I was, I just, it, nobody saw it coming. Not only me, everyone else. That, uh, so the two major aspects of the decision were that, um, first, that states could opt out of the Medicaid expansion. So this idea of floating all the categories up to 133%, the Supreme Court decided this can't be forced on the states. They're allowed to choose whether to expand or not, and, and that issue is being debated uh, right now in, 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 in uh, many state houses, including uh, here in, in, in Montana. And I won't go into the details, but simply say that one of the surprising aspects is of, of all the lower courts that had heard this case, lots of district courts, lots of courts of appeals, lots of judges, lots of opinions, not a single one had, had ruled uh, this way. Um, uh, none of the dissenting judges, what have you. Uh, yet we had a 7-2 majority. Uh, uh, the five conservatives and the two, uh, uh, the two, uh, two of the liberals all, you know, agreed. It wasn't even a close call at the Supreme Court, uh, which, which obviously made substantial new law that surprised people. The other piece is with respect to the individual mandate, although it was upheld. Uh, so in these both respects, the court, uh, on balance, uh, decided not to strike down the law. Um, and I won't go into any great detail, but uh, the conservative uh, minority, the four just, uh, dissenting conservative justices, said, well, because of these deficiencies in the law, we would have told Congress to go back and start over again. But uh, uh, Justice Roberts, this is swing vote, said, no, we'll simply uphold the law, but with these two uh, major qualifications. That states can opt out of the Medicaid expansion, but essentially individuals can mo opt out of the, of, of the, of the individual mandate. The, the individual mandate was, was, uh, was um, uh, held to be not valid as a, as a regulatory measure, as, uh, as an act, overt command of, uh, to, to regulate the citizenry, but it was uh, upheld only as, as a form of a tax or condition on a tax, so that the same way in which if you, you know, uh, buy an you know, electric car, you get a tax credit. If you get insurance, uh, you don't get a tax credit, but if you don't get insurance, you get a tax penalty. In that sort of general sense of things, uh, Congress had that, uh, upheld that the mandate was, uh, was valid. But as a result, uh, Justice Roberts, in, in, in the governing opinion, said explicitly this means that it essentially becomes a play or pay option for individuals, the same way as for employers. It doesn't, it's not against the law to be uninsured the way uh, the, the law appeared to be written. Uh, it was construed to be uh, an, an option that you choose um, and, and pay the consequence on your taxes. Now that's a subtlety that's important to lawyers, but I think in terms of conveying the sense of what the law does, is it a, a civic and legal responsibility to be insured, or is it simply a choice you make, like renting or buying a house or any, any number of things that, that uh, is completely up to you? We'll kind of see how that gets spun out here over the next few months as, as the whole uh, structure begins to take shape. But legally, this is how it was upheld. And this sort of walking the tightrope of saying, well, it's a tax for purposes of the constitutional authority, but uh, by the way, it's not a tax when it comes to the question of whether it's premature to hear it because uh, there's another law that says you can't challenge your taxes until they're due, and these are not taxes that were due, but they waive that. So well, it's not really a tax for that purpose, but uh, it is a tax for this purpose. Is again, uh, a fine <laughs> sort of construction of the law that only a, a smart lawyer, and we've got a bunch of them in the Supreme Court, could make. But it's one that, again, of all the judges, maybe a couple dozen, only one had uh, agreed to this particular constru construction below. So it, 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 it was uh, a quite, uh, quite a surprise, I think, to, to, to everyone. But in the process of deciding these fine points, there were sort of broad, sort of higher-themed um, issues of, of social justice and responsibility um, in keeping with the theme for this conference that, um, that the justices discussed. And so I'm going to switch away from this sort of summary of, of what uh, the, the case held to sort of more of um, what, what the court said. And, and this is in response to the question of whether uh, using its, its power to regulate commerce could Congress force people to purchase insurance. 
and 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 uh, the core holding was uh, no that they couldn't uh, that the, the the mandate was not valid as 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 a regulatory measure, and Justice Roberts explained it this way. Um, he uh, he said that uh, the reforms threatened to impose these massive new costs on insurers. Why? Uh, because they're, they're now required to accept all these unhealthy people, but they're prohibited from charging them any rates, uh, anything more than the community rate, uh, and so they can't charge them enough to, cut, to pay for the coverage. So if that were to happen, the insurers would significantly have to increase their premiums on everyone. The community rate would go way up if you simply said buy insurance on the way to the hospital. So. Uh, Justice Roberts uh, saw the individual mandate as a solution to the problem that Congress itself created. That in effect, Congress, by messing with the natural market conditions, was creating a problem for which the mandate was a necessary solution. Not that sort of the natural state of things is that, you know, we all have sort of basic access as humans to, you know, uh, care and, and what have you, or that uh, the, the, the natural way for markets to function is, is to charge everybody the same rate, but that the natural thing is for each of us to be assessed our individual health status, and Congress prohibited that, created a problem, and it needed the mandate to fix the problem. Uh, so in doing so, uh, he's concerned about the, sort of the impact on liberty that uh, this mandate forces into the insurance pool uh, healthier individuals whose premiums on average will be higher than their health care expenses. And it's that, in that way that we allow insurers to subsidize the cost of covering the unhealthy people. So it's a forced cross-subsidization by, again, forcing people not only to purchase, but forcing them to pay more than they really should pay. And so uh, Justice Roberts seems to be really invoking these themes of, of, of sort of a right to either be uninsured or to purchase insurance at your true uh, innate health status. Um, as sort of a form of an individual freedom, individual right, or I, I even feel like there's kind of a notion of a property right. I have a sort of a property right in my health status that I have a right to sort of, uh, you know, engage with in, in terms of the market. Um, 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 I'm, I'm taking some poetic license there, but there's sort of that intonation in, in terms of, of sort of the social uh, equity and justice. So in her dissenting opinion on this question of the Commerce Authority, Justice um, uh, Ginsburg took uh, Chief Justice uh, to task on this very point. So she said what I obviously agree with, uh, so, uh, but just to quote the language for what it is, in the fullness of time, people who are now young and healthy will become uh, the old and infirm. You shift from the lower end of that curve to the upper end, uh, it happens to many of us, or viewed over a lifespan, the, the costs tend to even out. We have some good years, we have some bad years, most of us. Uh, and so uh, the young who pay more now uh, uh, will get the benefit of the bargain later on in life when they're senior citizens. And so uh, to that extent, uh, it, it seemed to her to be uh, a fair deal. Um, and even if uh, at the end of the day there are some folks who over the lifetimes pay more for their health insurance uh, than they receive in services, that's not unfair because that's the whole idea of insurance. That's the way insurance is supposed to work. You pool risk uh, in order to make uh, costs affordable for everyone. So those are the two contrasting um, uh, social uh, views on this that are so well captured, uh, I think, uh, in these uh, particular portions of the, I think it was a 200-page opinion that otherwise might have gotten buried and I just wanted to highlight. So, so moving ahead then, um, what does that tell us about the ethics of community rating? Well, I don't have much more to say than what's already been said. There are two points of view on this. Um, and, and, and let me sort of, in, in support of my view, which is that it's, 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 it's fair enough <laughs> uh, the, to, uh, uh, that it's sort of a compromise. You could do pure community rating. You could do uh, full age adjusted. We ended up with something in the middle, Salomonic, three to one instead of one to one or five to one. Massachusetts, by the way, under, uh, uh, Governor Romney at the time had two to one age rating, so his was more socialistic than the Obama uh, plan by, by a, a, a factor of whatever that is, two to three. So uh, is this in sort of an inherent aspect of markets that uh, insurance is, 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 is risk rated? Well, not necessarily. If you think about how most of us have health insurance, all the stuff I've been talking about, medical underwriting and community rating, is not really an issue. Most of us get health insurance through the workplace. And group insurance is inherently community rated for the group of people, for the community of people covered by uh, that um, uh, insurance group. So uh, when an insurance company quotes a rate to an employer group, they say here's the total cost, and then the employer simply divides that per worker uh, regardless of age and says I'll pay for 
70% of it, and we'll take the other 30% out of your paycheck. Everybody gets exactly the same amount taken out of their paycheck. Well, that is pure community rating. There's no age adjustment for the health insurance premium contributions that, that uh, workers make through the workforce. Now, there's a bit of sort of a tax law requirement that makes that come about, but it's also sort of the way that things naturally evolved when, when the market moved towards uh, group-based health insurance. And we don't think it's unfair. In fact, many people would think it would be just the opposite, uh, uh, very, very unfair to, to change from that. So just shifting from individual purchase to group purchase changes, uh, I think, the whole sort of baseline reference point for what we think is correct or not correct. Again, uh, you know, views differ on whether you ought to charge uh, uh, women more than men uh, who uh, in, 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 in their 20s and 30s and 40s are particularly, particularly higher cost, partly because they just like going to the doctor more and, and, and uh, uh, for some reason um, uh, and uh, what have you. Um, you know, another example that occurred to me, this idea of sort of uh, taxing the young to support uh, the elderly, I mean, that's what Social Security does. I mean, we frame it in terms of setting aside our own money to cover our own retirement, but in reality, we're paying now so that uh, others who are older can, can have uh, the benefits of, of retirement uh, later. So lots of other respects in which society makes this sort of uh, decision about generational equity in terms of, 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 of um, that, that would support community rating. So I think it's an issue that can fairly be viewed from different perspectives, but it's not, um, uh, 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 there's plenty of sort of, I think, social and, and uh, uh, ethical sort of uh, precedent for, for this particular solution. Um, yet, it, it, all this continues to get debated. So shifting back to sort of what's coming down the road, um, I, I mean, it, it is true, as Jim was saying, that this is sort of confounding us that, that, that the debate never dies. You know, we had the vote, vote in Congress. We had the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the vote in, 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 in the Supreme Court. We had uh, the recent election, and at each of these stages, the issue is, you know, should the law live or die? And, 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 the, and the opposition just doesn't give up. Um, and so it's just like this, uh, you know, uh, alluding to popular culture, uh, you know, the, 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 the argument that never, the, that never goes away. And it, it, it uh, so it's con con continued to be socially divisive, I think, uh, for the next few years, and particularly so over the next few months, because we're going to begin to see the actual rollout of these major provisions, um, the, uh, the new uh, the, 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 the period for signing up for this insurance, the uh, to uh, become uh, eligible for the new uh, the terms of insurance, all that begins in October. Uh, open enrollment, early sign up is in October for insurance that takes effect in January. So leading up to October 1, we're going to hear a lot about this, and, and of course uh, beginning in January 1, we're going to hear a lot about it. So let me just sort of be kind of crystal clear about what people's choices are going to be, um, and then uh, return to the panel to go back to the issues of social justice and what have you. So, um, because a lot of focus is going to be on the 20-somethings out there, and are they going to sign up? Uh, because as you look at the problem of the uninsured and the problem of adverse selection, waiting till you need it to buy the insurance, uh, a lot of that is sort of the focus is on uh, this issue of what's called the young invincibles, people who feel like they have better things to spend their money on than insurance right now because you're healthy now, you don't really foresee bad things happening. If something bad, really bad happens, you can go to the emergency room, it'll be taken care of, uh, but meantime, um, why should I be taking my scarce resources and buying insurance? And this is why uh, such a larger percentage of, of people in their 20s are uninsured than, than people in, in, in upper ages, for, even though they have an easier time finding insurance because they're healthy and easier time paying for it because it is age rated. They tend more than others to, to remain uh, uninsured. And so the hope is that they'll respond positively to this new system. And so uh, let me explain to those who are uh, in their 20s what, what you can expect. Well, again, um, uh, if you're under 26, you can stay on your parents' plan once you, once you graduate. If um, you're over 26 and, and uh, your income isn't that great, you can just sign up for Medicaid if you're earning less than roughly $15,000 a year. And a Medicaid, again, is this uh, completely free uh, program um, uh, paid for by the state if the state decides to expand. If not, then you'll have to move to California or Washington State, I suppose. Um, if you earn more than $15,000, um, uh, anywhere up to roughly $28,000, you get quite substantial sub subsidies uh, to purchase private insurance through these, uh, what we're calling the exchange. Um, um, that would reduce the cost of that insurance to anywhere from 3% to 8% of your income, income, depending on where you fall in that range. And, and so that's the subsidized, but you would be subject to the mandate. If you um, earn more than $45,000 a year, um, 
I mean, if you earn more than 28, but up to 45, you also get a subsidy, but that subsidy reduces your insurance cost to only 9.5% of income. So that phase, you get a discount, but you're not subject to the mandate. So you can choose, you can decline to buy the insurance and not have to pay the higher tax um, if you're in, in that range. And of course, if you're above 45,000, uh, we don't need to be hearing from you because you've got a good job for, <laughs> in your 20s. So, uh, and hopefully that job provides insurance and you have to sign up for it. So, uh, that's the quick rundown. Now, um, what about uh, these exchanges? Uh, the, the term marketplace is now being used. The uh, exchange is, 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 was the sort of a policy wonk terminology, but they're going to be called the insurance marketplace. These things um, are uh, non-insurance companies. This is not government-run insurance, but it's a government-monitored system for selling private insurance. It would function much like uh, Amazon or something where you shop for stuff online. Uh, so the options will be presented to you in a way I'll just show you in a second uh, that presents um, uh, the available options and let you know what their cost and, and what the pros and cons are, the bells and whistles, and you pick what you want. Uh, each state will have one, but uh, states can either run them themselves or can let the feds run them for them, and uh, Montana opted to let the feds run this because there's a lot of startup cost and, and economies of scale and such built into this, and so it doesn't necessarily make sense for a small, smaller state to set this up because, it, again, it all is is a web interchange, and the actual insurance you buy will be driven by uh, the particular insurance companies in each state that want to participate. Um, again, this is uh, the process you go through to uh, receive the tax credits and subsidies and what have you. If you don't have employer-based insurance, this is not for the employer-based insurance. It's mainly for individual insurance. Uh, it's also a way to find out, are you eligible for Medicaid or are you supposed to buy insurance? And so if you're not sure, you go through this process um, of, of finding out. Uh, the, the, the exchange uh, also sort of monitors uh, the behavior uh, of health plans to make sure they're offering uh, the right terms of coverage uh, with uh, adequate uh, uh, choice of doctors and hospitals um, and, and, and that they meet all the sort of uh, the new standards that, that, that are being imposed. Um, and um, 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 I, I'll, I'll save other details for later. So this is how it works in Massachusetts. Again, the proof of concept was in Massachusetts under uh, uh, Governor Romney's uh, leadership. They set up this whole basic system of uh, the employer pay or pay plus the individual mandate plus the penalties plus the exchange. And you simply click on this website and according to your category, uh, drill down a step further and you say, I want uh, top of the line coverage versus, uh, you know, middle of the pack coverage versus bottom basement coverage. And that's largely driven by the copays and deductibles, uh, similar to uh, uh, HSA type of insurance. Um, and based on that, you get a broad array of choices. And you say, well, among these choices, I want to sort of narrow it down to this particular package. And once you pick the package you want that has the assortment of, 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 of benefits and what have you, you find out you've got these four choices. And this would be in Boston. So some of these choices are substantially higher than others. And the main driver of these choices are do they cover all the big time Boston, uh, Harvard, you know, hospitals and such, or do they just cover community hospitals or more of the safety net hospitals or the public hospitals that have you go through more um, uh, community health centers and such. And so Boston tends to sort of divide between the top tier, you know, best that medicine has to offer kind of hospitals versus kind of your good enough for government work sort of <laughs> public hospitals and, and safety net hospitals. And, and uh, you can buy insurance that covers one or the other, and this displays that choice for you in, in terms that are reasonably understandable if you can afford the 45 minutes to an hour and a half that it takes to wade through all this. So um, that's what's coming your way beginning uh, October 1st uh, for effective uh, January 1st. And so this giant clock is ticking in, in Washington, getting closer and closer to the countdown. And meanwhile, uh, Kathleen Sebelius is stacking up this giant uh, stack of regulations. It's all sort of immensely complex. Uh, it's immensely complex because inherently to sort of make all these sort of moving pieces fit together in a way that sort of keeps the private market functioning, keeps employers engaged, keeps uh, the boundaries uh, defined and policed between Medicaid and the exchanges and the small group and the large group and Medicare. This fragmented complex system that we have which is largely codified, but is not eliminated, is not replaced, but is simply stretched out in places to fill in the re remaining gaps, is enormously complex undertaking, uh, particularly when you allow each state to sort of some leeway to go about it in a somewhat different way. 
um, and, and anticipating all the sort of the sharp scrutiny that comes with uh, a set of centralized federal rules. Uh, it has been sort of a monumental task, uh, not only to sort of write all these regs, but to read all these regs and to figure out how it all goes. And so uh, much more to sort of be uh, learned, to be sort of uh, figured out by trial and error and um, many things that could go wrong, but this is, uh, this is what's coming down the pike. So with that sort of grand overview, uh, thank you for your attention and let's hear from the panelists. Thank you very much. So um, let's try to keep this conversational and, and um, maybe aim for uh, short, shortish answers, um, you know, three minutes or, or so, three to five minutes, maybe five minutes to start. But I just want to introduce the other panelists here uh, quickly. Um, to my immediate left is Megan McArdle, um, who's a special correspondent for Newsweek and the Daily Beast. Um, former senior editor at the Atlantic Monthly and a writer for The Economist. She's written ex extensively on the opposition to and the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, I remember reading her a long time ago when we were, uh, I think, both living in New York after 9-11 after and she was blogging as uh, Jane Galt. And so she's been in these debates for, um, for most of her uh, adult life. Um, uh, then Susan Kohler, uh, next, is a Chief Executive Officer of the Missoula Aging Services since 1983 and has more than 30 years of experience in community development, nonprofit management, and senior advocacy. Uh, Susan can be heard, I, I often hear, on Montana Public Radio uh, advocating for uh, seniors and is, is a prominent commentator in that area in Montana. Uh, Larry White, who's a, a, an old uh, colleague um, from my prior job, is the director of uh, Western Montana Area Health Education Center and a research associate professor here at the University of Montana School of Public Health and Community Health Services. Um, Larry's uh, worked a lot in terms of studying our healthcare system in Montana, and, and uh, he and I worked together in a, in a hospitals report uh, several years ago. Um, so I wanted to start in terms of focusing on this question after that overlay, focusing on this, this question of uh, should the young subsidize the old, um, maybe challenge the, the hypothetical a little bit and think about um, uh, how well the old come out under, under the Affordable Care Act as, as, a, as a demographic and how the young will fare in it. And I wanted to start with you, with you Susan, to just start with some brief comments in terms of where does the Affordable Care Act um, take uh, the senior population in terms of health care? Does it, does it contain any big fixes? Or are there still some issues left to address? And you want my comments brief? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. I think okay. we all do. Let's well, have a you're conversation. You're going to have to go like that if that's the case. I will. Uh, the first thing is um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And as an advocate for older adults, um, uh, one of the things this gives me the opportunity to do is talk about one of the greatest forms of discrimination in our country today is ageism. And so based on the title, although it was meant to be provocative, it also continues to put forth those issues of ageism as if the very fact that we have older people um, it's something to discriminate against or compare against in the youth. And we already have plenty of age wars going on. We don't need to feed that. That said, just because it gave me that opportunity to say it, um, I'll move on. Um, the Affordable Care Act, um, as I look at it, and again, I, m most of my involvement is community um, supports. It's primarily non-medical. And one of the things that the Affordable Care Act doesn't do is address some of those very essential parts of what helps people age in place um, as they get older. And that starts at the federal level is that there really is no long-term care policy. What is the policy about as we age, where are we going to invest our finances in terms of medical uh, and other forms of care? Now, I give the example you have um, right now in the state, in all states for the most part, um, nursing homes are an automatic. If a person gets to a level of care that they need a nursing home uh, level of care, they are allowed to go in and get paid for with Medicaid um, uh, nursing home. But if they want to stay in their own home, 
which is what a majority of older adults do, plus the fact that it's proven to be cost effective, they can only do that if there is a, quote, slot available. Um, currently, Medicare doesn't pay for long-term care. Um, and at certain times when they leave the hospital and they go for rehab into a nursing home, you'll have a certain amount of time it pays for. Um, but it doesn't pay for assisted living. It doesn't pay for you to get meals delivered to your home, and yet a good 60% of people end up in nursing homes, excuse me, in hospitals that are over the age of 65 have one of their diagnoses as malnutrition. And one in seven older adults are experiencing um, senior hunger. So when you look at that in terms of the medical realm, the uh, um, the Affordable Act doesn't cover that at all. And 80% of the things that older adults need, it doesn't cover. Whether it's the activities of daily, daily living or IADLs, you know, transportation, um, it doesn't take care of uh, toileting, dressing, uh, feeding, things that as older adults get to that point, they need, but they have to pay out of pocket. Um, for it because Medicare doesn't pay for it. Um, and unless you purchase long-term care insurance, which is only affordable and it's an industry that's really struggling right now, um, that you aren't gonna get those kind of support. So that's some of the shortfalls in my, my opinion of, of the Affordable Care Act. I absolutely agree with the universal um, coverage of health care for all people. I've always believed that it's a basic human right like our education system is. And when we look at young versus old, look at just our um, school systems. Uh, older adults paid before they had kids, why they had kids, after they had kids, and they pay for uh, through taxes and, and institutions like universities. That's just one example of where they're paying, where they don't necessarily um, are uh, participating in it. However, I always tell them that we're educating their caregivers of tomorrow. Um, the other concern, and I'll just, that will be my last one because you'll be staring at me more than you are now. Um, just to give you an idea where I see a, uh, concerns is, uh, as many of you may be aware of, when um, the Medicare system introduced um, drug coverage. It's called the Medicare Part D. And it was intended to allow the private market insurers to come in and offer plans to older adults uh, for prescription drug coverage. Um, it has made a great difference in terms of people getting prescriptions that they need, but it's a nightmare the way it's set up. Um, Any time that you require a person to go, and let's, let's just use an example of an 85-year-old who has to go and look, and, and they aren't uh, computer savvy, um, and every year they have to see if the insurance company they have this year covers the same drugs next year and whether the price has changed. And then they can only choose once during the open enrollment but the insurance company can choose not to fund one, not to provide one of their drugs that they signed up originally it did have it, but three months later they took it away. The person can't change their policy, but the insurance company can change when they want to. Um, and then there are 50 choices in the state of Montana. Um, the choices were too great. So not totally understanding exchanges, but looking at some of the examples that we saw today, it worries me for all of you um, in what process you might have to go through and whether um, insurance companies are going to have the kind of oversight that they need to have to make sure that they're following what is expected. Um, and that's when the argument people say they want less government. That's how we ended up with Enron and some of the other things that are going on in our country. And I would hate to see it in health um, in our health care. And that's just my personal opinion. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Um, so, so Susan suggests there might not be as much in here at one en end of the age spectrum in the Affordable Care Act as, as we might hope. Larry, do you want to talk about how much there might be some, some actually surprising benefits there for the younger end of the generation, the, the utilization? Is there a population out there that uh, wants and needs uh, the type of insurance choices the Affordable Care Act can provide? Well, Anthony, I, I think there is. Um, 
to uh, overview this a little bit more, um, the question about whether the young should subsidize the old, I think is a, a variation on or an elaboration on the questions that Jack Mudd raised last night when he repeatedly asked us, uh, what is my responsibility for my health? And then what is the community's responsibility for my health care? Um, and uh, that uh, issue, uh, I'm not going to try to uh, resolve or, or answer specifically, uh, nor would I incidentally try to uh, answer the question of uh, what is young versus the old. For me, young is anybody that's under 70. Um, but actually, uh, we're, I think, uh, maybe uniquely uh, privileged here in Montana to have some hard data that would shed some light on this uh, this aspect of the, of the ACA question. And, and uh, what I'm referring to is a uh, statewide survey that was conducted or, or was actually uh, published, issued by the Bureau of Business and Economic Research here at the University of Montana just last November. This was a survey uh, and a study that was commissioned by the uh, Commissioner of Securities and Insurance, uh, Monica Lindine. And it uh, was um, uh, focused on the status of Montana health insurance population. That was the title of the study. It was, had it as a purpose to try to uh, study the insured, the uh, uninsured, and the underinsured. Um, and uh, incidentally, that's available on the BBER uh, website. Um, buried inside this report, which is pretty darn long, and, uh, but a highlight reel of it would be just this. 195,000 Montanans are uninsured. Um, and um, when, they, when these uninsured were asked, um, and asked by some age cohorts, um, why they were uninsured, only 16% said that they wanted to spend their money on other things. The vast majority of all of the underinsured uh, would uh, said that they were uninsured because either they had a low wage job or that the health insurance uh, was too expensive or that they were unemployed. Um, and so uh, stating that in just a little bit different way, uh, about 71% of all of the 19 to 26 year olds uh, said they would buy insurance if they could afford it. And, and that percentage uh, rose to about 78% for the age cohort of 27 to 64. So um, the analysis that they uh, did of the data uh, concluded that only uh, 16,000 uh, individuals were these so-called uh, young and invincibles that uh, that's like uh, 16,000 out of a million people. Um, who wanted to spend their money on other things. So, uh, you know, my sense of it is, is that the vast majority of the young Montanans would like to have insurance, uh, regardless of whether it supports the old. Um, and um, just as a general and final comment, that, that survey uh, data is generally supported by some other data and other surveys that have been done uh, around the United States. But I think this one from Montana is very recent and very detailed. Thanks, Larry. So, Megan, it sounds like uh, we're getting ready to put this into place. Mark's talked about the overall scheme. Larry's talked about the, the demand there. Um, is it going to work? Uh, well, define work. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that there's no question that what we are doing, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about um, how to get the young and healthy to buy insurance. And, and in some sense, this was a euphemism, right? What we wanted to do was tax them in order to provide insurance for sicker, older people. Um, and because, in fact, health insurance is a hard thing to, it's sort of a misnomer to talk about insurance. Um, getting old is not an unpredictable event. I mean, we hope it's not unpredictable. It's going to happen to most people. Um, what we're actually talking about is redistributing. The, real, the core issue with, with health care is that the costs vary widely between people um, in ways that may not match up with their income. 
And we're trying to, we've a number of different ways to overcome that, but the, the, the idea that we have settled on is that collectively we are going to force people who don't currently buy insurance to buy it. We will subsidize the ones of them who can't afford it. Um, and this is going to constitute a large transfer from wealthier, younger, um, and less sick taxpayers to older and sicker taxpayers and the less affluent. Um, when you talk about generational compacts, I think that there's, there's always inherently an issue with these things, right? Because, in fact, it's not that the younger workers are going to give money to older workers now and then those older workers will give it back to them later. It's that we're promising that an entirely different cohort of workers, most of whom haven't been born yet, um, will, when these people are older, pay for benefits. And that's a hard promise to make. And as we've seen, uh, it hasn't worked out necessarily that well uh, for a lot of countries or, you know, you have to break those compacts. It's really difficult because you, there's, there's a, a sandwich generation that gets caught in the middle, right? They paid a lot for their elders. They don't get so much paid for them, but because they were paying, they didn't save. And because maybe we made a promise and they had an expectation, they didn't save to cover these costs. Um, so how well is this compact going to work? And I, I think I look at this, I'm, I'm not too hopeful so far. Obviously, I think uh, Obamacare was passed under much less than ideal circumstances. Uh, not only was it not particularly well thought out, they didn't have time to fix it. They kind of expected that this was a first draft that they would fix, and then they had a choice between passing a very bad first draft and not passing anything. It's kind of like the grad student who gets to uh, the day before his dissertation is due, and do I hand in the pile of not such good stuff, or do I ask for an extension? Um, and the end result has been that a lot of the things that we expected didn't happen. The great mystery, I think, the, the single biggest mystery has been where are the uninsured? We were told that there was a large po population of people who couldn't buy insurance. Not that they couldn't afford it, but that they actually just couldn't get anyone to write them insurance. So we created high risk pools for them. They didn't show up. At one point, we had 4% of the expected number of people enrolled. Uh, the high-risk pools are still wildly under-enrolled, and yet they're going to cost more than uh, anticipated, and they're about to run out of money. That's not a good sign for what we are expecting when we enroll the rest of the uninsured population uh, come 2014. Other issues I think we have to look at, the exchanges, it's not clear to me that they're going to be ready. Uh, you know, there, there have been already some worrying signs out of HHS that imply that maybe there's not going to be an exchange for people to enroll in come October 1st when they're supposed to be live. Um, you have to look at, you know, the one success story that we can, that everyone is pointing to is in itself distressing. Everyone says, look at all the people we covered who are under 26. Well, it was, that was the easiest thing to do. If you mandate that a very young population that's pretty cheap to insure can join their, their parents' insurance, no one thought that part wasn't going to work. Um, you know, and, and in general, this is cheap because this is a group that, aside from some rare cancers, a couple of autoimmune diseases, and non-work accidents, is in general incredibly cheap to insure. That's not the hard part. The hard parts, things like getting the financing right, that stuff is all getting more complicated. For example, one of the big cost, uh, one of the big cost savings that we were supposed to get was accountable care organizations, sort of like HMOs, but better. They're going to, you know, you're going to have a patient home and that they're going to help lower costs, be accountable for your care, pay for health and not for treatment. Um, all of these things that have been the holy grail of, of healthcare analysis since any of us got into it. Um, and now it turns out that the, the model, the models like Mayo and the Cleveland Clinic don't want to participate in the program. The, the people who did want to participate in the program suddenly balked when the HHS started to say, okay, well, here's the pay for performance part. They were like, whoa, <laughs> I don't think we need performance metrics here. This is, this is complicated and we're worried about these metrics. Um, all of the kind of technocratic cost control, this is how it's all going to harmoniously work together into one piece, so far has failed to gel. And, you know, you look at things like multi-employer union plans, which ensure one in six people in the country uh, one in six in the private sector, I should say. Uh, they still haven't gotten the rules straight for those. The unions are saying, look, we may have to dump all of our workers on the exchanges, which no one planned for, because they don't know how to deliver insurance under these new rules. Meanwhile, you have companies trying to pull out and saying, we're going to self-insure in order to get around these regulations that you put in place. So what you're seeing is much more gaming and behavior than people anticipated, and also that the details of implementation, the kind of nitty-gritty, now I have to build a computer system, that wasn't planned for, 
Um, it hasn't gotten planned for adequately because they waited so long to let states decide whether they were going to enroll. The actual doing it part has been very hard. It was very easy to articulate a lot of goals about cost control, about paying for treatment rather, uh, for health rather than treatment. It has proven extremely difficult to build this incredibly complex apparatus to deliver that, and I'll stop there. Um, Mark, I want to give you a chance to, to respond. One of the things I think uh, that Megan points out is that there, there might be a larger cross-subsidy here than just community rating. There's, there's of course, all of, although the Affordable Care Act itself is technically revenue neutral, um, uh, there's a major, it's built on this major cross-subsidization of us having a government that we refuse to pay for. Um, and those subsidies, Megan's point about uh, can we promise that those subsidies are always going to be there when um, we're facing the deficit debt, this is a thing that's going to come up uh, next, uh, the panel on the Medicaid expansion as well. Um, you want to respond to that or, or any of the other kind yeah, of that, glitches? Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. The, the sandwich generation and will that promise be there? Uh, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's, it's really uh, a key point because it goes to the core of the logic that says, you know, uh, we set the rules and you'll get the benefit of the bargain later on if we can't really promise or guarantee that. Then, uh, you know, I do think it's true for a lot of other programs such as, you know, Social Security and what have you. Um, but uh, to scrutinize this particular element on that basis, um, I, I think it, it's a sobering thought. Now, I mean, one thing I'm curious about is, is this sandwich generation, the one that kind of uh, pays in but doesn't get out. I mean, isn't it the case that uh, when we get to that point, they'll be in charge of stuff, right? Won't they be in Congress? <laughs> Won't they be, uh, you know, uh, the, the ones running things? And so can't they uh, make sure that the, that the bargain stays in place? Uh, well, I guess I, I would ask, uh, I mean, first of all, if the money isn't there, it doesn't really matter whether you're in charge. And that's something that the people of Cyprus, for example, are discovering this week, is that if you don't have the money to cover a promise that you've made, um, you can vote all you want, but if the money isn't there, and you know, when you look at where the budget's headed, and if you look at the fact that we took $500 billion over 10 years worth of Medicare savings and we applied it to expanding coverage rather than to making Medicare solvent, um, you ask yourself, well, when, if healthcare costs keep growing faster than GDP, is there any possible way right. that this check could be actually ma made good at the bank? Um, it's certainly, even if you, you know, it may be an open question, yeah. but when you write that check and you tell someone, you pay now, we'll pay you, you know, I'll gladly yeah. pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today, right. um, and there's some uncertainty about the Tuesday part. Uh -huh. Right, so you know, what we're seeing now with, in, with respect to Medicare reform under this issue is, is sort of a transitional, we'll, we'll um, sort of gradually year by year, three months by three months, uh, you know, evolve into the new system. So nobody, there's not an abrupt shift. Um, so there are ways, if you can't uphold the bargain, there's a ways of getting out of it <laughs> that, that don't leave, uh, uh, you know, a sandwich generation with, with, with completely no benefit of the, of the bargain. But it is, an, it, it is a very, I think, um, troubling challenge, and so one I, I sort of want to acknowledge um, that, that I'm not fully able to deal with. Sort of, at the point in time, at the sort of current moment, uh, with respect to the, uh, the um, wealth transfer point uh, that you raised that um, Anthony asked me to address, uh, you have to sort of look at the whole picture. It's, it's possible to take a slice of folks that, you know, greater than 400 percent, that under age 45 or whatever, that come out one way, and another slice that come out a different way, and this is more of the divisive us versus them and what have you that um, naturally plays into things. You, you want to say, where do I fit, and then what's my group? But, you know, taking a step back from that and saying, you know, a somewhat sort of uh, higher view, you know, resolution, lower level res resolution, looking, looking at, at broader groupings. Folks uh, in, in the younger generation come out pretty well in this. For one reason, uh, you know, go, coming back to Medicaid, if the state expands, which is an open question, uh, this sort of threshold of folks under $15,000, that characterizes a greater proportion of younger folks than, than older folks. So they come out ahead on this uh, Medicaid expansion in a big way. So uh, uh, the, similarly with respect to the subsidies uh, that, that scale up from um, you know, 138 to 400%, uh, disproportionately younger folks are going to be in the higher subsidized group. Um, 
And so it's going to be the, a relative, sort of small minority of uh, younger folks who have to end up paying the full freight on, uh, on the age-weighted, uh, uh, community-rated uh, premiums. Most of them will get the benefit of the larger bargain with respect to Medicaid, with re respect to the subsidization. Uh, so that's in terms of the benefits from it. In terms of what's paid in, I mean, the main source of the funding for this is not community-rated premiums. That's just a sort of a, a, you know, sort of a ballast in the ship that kind of keeps the ship afloat, et cetera, in terms of the insurance market. But most of the money that's sort of being brought in is being brought in from an entirely different set of sort of funding provisions and taxes that, uh, you know, like the tanning salons and like the cuts to Medicare Advantage plans and stuff that come. Although from. I would point out that younger people do are, are the predominant users. I, wasn't, I thought you would go there. <laughs> but so, so it, is, it is this sausage that was made in this process that, that Jim and others have described. And, and, and if you take particular elements of it, they, they do seem very unsavory. But I'd say you've got you to take the whole well, piece of sausage in here. Could I actually make a very brief point? Right. And then I want to bring, bring yeah, Susan and Larry sorry, back. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, I think that this is actually a big part of the generational compact. If you think that um, providers the, the cuts to providers are taking away some of the money that funds innovation, you actually have a big generational inequity, right? Because what you have is, I would have had future treatments that might have saved my life, and now some of those people will die. Or some of those people will not be healthy in 2080 because we didn't do the investment now because instead we used that money to do this coverage expansion. It's, I mean, the, these questions are very complicated, and of course it's really hard to know how they come out. Um, but that is certainly one aspect that you should think about when you talk about these trade-offs is that we may just be trading, m more people may die later because fewer, if you, know, if you think that this is Boy, going to reduce You think your way, how do you solve any problems? That's, that's really <laughs> 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 So, um, Susan, I wanted to go back to you. One of the things that, that Mark had suggested in his talk also is, is that in, in getting this revenue neutrality and trying to, and trying to um, fund the subsidies and other programs in the Affordable Care Act, they, they might have taken some of the low-hanging fruit uh, off the table, to mix, it, to mix a metaphor. Um, and in terms of making progress in these other areas, when we're, when we're not looking at a, a federal budget that is uh, likely to increase much in the future, um, um, how are we going to address some of the problems that you talk about when we're in this, this fiscal austerity? Um. Well, I, I often believe that Congress has the ability to solve these problems, but politics gets in the way. Um, and we use the example of Social Security. It's a fairly si simple fix, but we don't seem to be able to do that. Um, you know, in how are we going to address some of these? Well, it's policies that need to be reviewed. Um, and like I talk about the long-term not having a long-term care policy and how important that would be and a cost savings if we shifted from uh, predominantly institutionalized care to more home-based care, um, to a more non-medical model, to more health promotion, disease prevention kinds of things. Um, that might, might be the, the way that this would balance out. Um, I do agree, and it does worry me, just because the reason I gave the Part D example is, um, like you had said, it would pass something that's not perfect, but we can fix it later. It's like trying to turn an ocean ship on a dime, you know, um, because of the fact that uh, to actually, once something gets into place, to tweak it and things like you would do in a... And a, and a group of people sitting down and saying, oh, this isn't quite working, why don't we just change it this way? That doesn't happen with Congress. And I, I would be concerned about that, too. Um, how do we um, make the changes as it comes out um, where we come with the difficulties that, that we experience? Um, and we have to look at a different way of delivering health care, and that's been discussed already. Um, but I do think universal coverage to start with is a good thing. I don't know whether the exchanges will work, and I don't know whether it's a good idea. It seems to me that we've been a have and have not society when it comes to health care for a long time, and we need to figure that out um, because from birth to, to death, we should have adequate health care, and we might eliminate some of these chronic diseases that um, cause the cost of health care. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Susan. Uh, Larry, I guess um, I mean, I'd like to hear, hear your response. Uh, one of the 
points of clarification also is trying to understand um, how much of the uh, uninsured, the, 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 in terms of a gap that can be closed, how much of that gap depends on the Medicaid expansion in your numbers and how much of it uh, is going to be these, these softer forms of subsidies and the exchanges? Right, well, um, as I said, there's 195,000 Montanans today who have no insurance coverage. Um, about 69,000, according to this uh, survey data from the Bureau, uh, would be eligible for uh, the expansion uh, under Medicaid. Another uh, 40 uh, plus thousand would be uh, participating because of the availability of the subsidized insurance uh, through the exchange. There would nevertheless be about uh, 80,000, about eight and a half percent of our uninsured um, eight, 8.5% of Montanans, so about 80,000, 85,000 would continue to be uninsured. So it doesn't um, remedy the entire uh, problem. It reduces it from 20% to 8.5%, uh, which uh, if you're looking for the, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good, as they say in, in a lot of uh, ways, and it would probably be the case here that if we don't do everything, we can't do anything. Um, well, we're, we're nearing the end, but I wanted to offer a, a kind of a lightning round closing, starting with Megan and giving Mark the last, last word, maybe just a, a minute on this question, and then, of course, we'll, we'll welcome everyone to come up here and continue the discussion. Megan? Um, well, you know, I, I think that uh, it is complicated, and we don't quite know how it's going to fall out yet. Uh, we will see in 2014 what happens, how people like it. Uh, the generational questions, I think, are not gonna be resolved for a while, which way the transfers are going and who the sandwich generation will end up being. Um, that said, I, my, my, my biggest issue would simply be that it's not at all clear to me that this is stable or that it is going to control costs. We could end up with a big budget crisis um, or simply a crisis where we have destroyed the insurance market without building something that is sustainable to replace it. I guess I would say that um, universal health care coverage to all still is a good idea. And you're right about we don't know how it's going to uh, play out, but not doing anything is not a good thing. And so um, it's a matter of being good stewards of the exchanges and monitoring it and then ultimately making changes along the way so the deals that we make with people, we're able to keep um, as people age through the process. Larry? Yes, well, um, the Affordable Care Act uh, had its uh, initial uh, impacts in 2010. Uh, the uh, ultimate rollout occurs by 2018. We are just into that. The cost savings are back end loaded into the uh, time frame of the act. Uh, it by no means is perfect. It was actually kind of a political uh, magic trick that it got passed at all. Oh, by the way, it's been attempted about every 15 years since Teddy Roosevelt's time. So uh, it's not like a new uh, problem that's trying to be solved. So uh, I think that. Um, it definitely uh, is at the inception. It's a big unknown. Uh, it will need improvements in lots of ways. But as I said just a minute ago, uh, the uh, perfect uh, is the uh, enemy of the good. And if we have to have it perfect uh, from the get-go, everybody can understand, we probably will never have it, uh, uh, the uh, uninsured problem solved. Well, on that theme is a great handoff. I, I live by that same philosophy. And, and I want to sort of make a call to sort of uh, taking a, a, as constructive uh, uh, and optimistic uh, an attitude as possible during this implementation phase. I mean, I think Megan's exactly right. There's a, a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainties, a lot of complexity. And I too worry that, I also worry that it may not prove to be sustainable. But I look also to Massachusetts where, uh, you know, again, uh, Massachusetts uh, doesn't uh, represent the rest of the country by any means. But uh, there, 
there was a very positive and constructive sort of embrace by all the major sort of social segments and interest groups to make uh, these same elements of reform work. And it's worked reasonably well. I mean, they've had problems, but it's, it's the highest cost state in the country, bar none. Yet, somehow they've managed to keep this thing afloat, and, and they work at it year by year to make it happen. But it, it's come about in a fairly constructive way, where the employers say, we, we see what our role is, where individuals accept that their sort of civic responsibility of, 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 of uh, arranging for insurance, of, 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 of signing up for insurance if it's affordable. And the government's worked with industry and various interest groups to, to uh, smooth over a lot of, of the rough edges. So, uh, you, know, you know, my hope is to depoliticize a lot of this uh, debate. It's not happening. Uh, but uh, I think that um, if, if we can uh, somehow uh, collectively come, uh, come at this in, 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 in with a constructive way, it, it has the, the better chance of working uh, and, and uh, avoiding the catastrophe that, uh, that Megan uh, worries about, as, 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 as do I. Well, with an eye on the, on the clock behind Mark, I guess time, time will tell. Um, we <laughs> hope to see you all tonight uh, at 7.30. We're going to convene in the UC Theater, which is just a few doors down there. And then tomorrow again, right back here at 10 in the morning. Please thank the panel, and we'll see you in a bit.